Hey guys, welcome back to Lux Biz. I'm Tatiana and today I'm going to help you find good suppliers when you're sourcing overseas. So we're going to go into two case studies based on my experience with suppliers in the past where I just didn't have a great experience with them, what I learned from them and what how it can help you. But before I get into that, I want to dive into some more practical tips that you can implement right now when you're searching for suppliers. So if you're sourcing overseas and in particular in Asia, I think the best place for you to source is on Alibaba.com. You know, it's just easy to use, it's organized, um, it's just getting better and better every day and there's so many suppliers on there. So, you know, if I head over to Alibaba and I want to find a hairbrush, that's the product I want to source, I type in hairbrush, there are going to be tens of thousands of different search results and it's going to be actually impossible for me to go through every single one of them. So you can filter things. Now, the first thing you need to know is that even though there's tens of thousands of search results, it doesn't mean that there are tens of thousands of suppliers. Sometimes one supplier who, is sourcing, who has one hairbrush will list several different listings for the same hairbrush because that increases their chance of you clicking on them. Um, but you can filter that out. So you can actually click on suppliers and it will show you one listing per supplier. So then you'll maybe have fewer search results. Now you might still have a lot. So then the next thing you do is you click on gold supplier. A gold supplier is someone who has paid Alibaba to be listed on there. So it shows that they're more serious about it. Um, you know, the thing is it's not really a high fee. So most suppliers do have the gold supplier badge. Now, if you still have a ton of search results, the next thing I would recommend you do is you click on assess supplier. So an assess supplier, there's actually much fewer uh, manufacturers who are assessed suppliers because it means that someone actually went to the manufacturing facility, they went to the warehouse and they inspected things, they saw that it's legitimate, they see you know everything that's going on and so Alibaba has assessed them. So there are fewer suppliers who do have that badge and when they do have it it's a really good sign. The next thing you guys should know is that there is a difference between a manufacturer and a trading company. So note the difference. A manufacturer is the person, the company, who is producing the goods. They are making them right there. They have a warehouse. They have a manufacturing facility where they are creating them from scratch. The trading um, supplier is the one who is kind of like the middleman in between the manufacturer and in between you. And here they are. And they will basically find products in China or wherever, and they will list them on their website and then you will find them thinking they're a supplier um, and then you'll purchase from them. And so oftentimes you're going to be spending more money when you buy from a trading company versus when you actually buy from the manufacturer itself. Now, how do you know if a supplier on Alibaba is actually a trading company or a manufacturer? Well, one thing is it actually says on their listing. So it will say if you click on the company, it will say whether it's trading a trading company, a manufacturer, or both. Sometimes they are both. Sometimes a manufacturer is also a trading company. The best thing you can have is going directly to the manufacturer themselves for the best rates and quality. Um, but you know, sometimes you might end up buying from a trading company. The next thing you want to do is you want to ask the supplier. So the next steps is communication. You really have to get in contact with the suppliers themselves. So initiate contact, ask them questions, and here are some things that you really need to ask them to really evaluate um, how legitimate they are. And I'd say the first thing is asking them for certificates. You have the, maybe it's not the first conversation you have, but you do want to ask them for this. So there are certificates that you're allowed to ask them for. You have the rights to see them. Some of them include a business license, a bank account certificate, a foreign trade registration certificate, an ISO 9001 certificate, which helps you understand that they have good quality management systems customs registration certificate so they are able to export test reports and in fact test reports are important for certain products so products like um, toys and electronics it's very common for you to actually need to get a test report um, if you're exporting into another country customs will actually ask you to have those test reports available and a performa invoice, which is going to make sure that you're spending your, the money that is going out of your account is going to their correct bank and company information. 
So you're allowed to ask for these certificates. If a supplier is hesitant to give you them or to show you them, um, that's a kind of a red flag for me. You know, most of the suppliers should have these certificates. They're pretty basic. You're not asking for anything too extreme. Um, and so if a supplier is not willing to let you see that, it's kind of a red flag for me. The next thing I recommend you doing is you ask, you let them know that at some point you are going to have a third party inspection agency inspect the products. So you're letting them know ahead of time, you're giving them warning ahead of time that, you know, before I pay you the remainder of the money and before you ship the products to me, I'm going to have someone inspect the products to ensure quality. And if you tell them this ahead of time, most likely they're going to be on their A game when they're manufacturing your products because they don't want any issues with the third party inspection agency, so they're going to give you good quality products. But if they back away and they say, no, we don't want you to have a third party inspection agency, we don't want someone else in our facility, that's a red flag. You know, They should ha be able to accommodate that request because that's pretty standard. And if they don't want anyone else in their facility, that might mean that some bad manufacturing practices are going on. Okay, the next thing you could do is you can tell them that you are going to draft up a contract between you and the supplier. In that contract, there's going to be a number of things. You're going to get as specific as possible. But one thing that you really want to mention is that there's going to be a time frame in the contract. So if they told you that it takes 45 days to manufacture your products, that's going to be in that contract. It's going to say 45 days plus seven days. You're going to give them seven days extra in case they have delays. But after seven days, if the products aren't done, they're going to start paying every single day. So you have to agree upon a certain amount, you know, maybe a percentage of the total order and uh, gets deducted from the balance that you owe them. And so when they know that every single day they're losing money, they're more likely to hurry up and finish uh, producing your products. Because if you don't have something like that and they quoted you 45 days and 55 days later the products are still not done, they're going to take their time. They have no reason to really rush things, um, especially if you guys don't have a great relationship or they see that they're not going to continue uh, the relationship with you, then they might take their time. Something else you want to mention ahead of time is you want to make sure that you let them know that your initial deposit for your inventory is going to be 30%. Typically 30% is paid ahead of time, 70% after the goods are done. That's very standard and sometimes manufacturers will say, no, we don't allow that. We want 50% ahead of time, 50% later, or sometimes even they'll say 70% ahead of time and 30% later, which is just not reasonable. It doesn't make sense. So you let them know ahead of time that's your standard and you're not going to change that and just be clear about that. And if a manufacturer doesn't like that, then you move on to the next one. The last thing that you wanna make sure that you track is communication. Communication is everything. As you'll see in the case studies I'm about to share with you, when you have lack of communication with your supplier, things go on and on and on and get delayed, especially if they're overseas and you're on a totally opposite time zone. You know, you might send them one email and they might get back to you a day later with another email and then you get back to them a day later with another email and it takes so long. So you wanna have fast communication. So put out a spreadsheet, create a spreadsheet, track all your suppliers on the spreadsheet and monitor how fast they are to get back to you because it's really important. They respect your time and you respect theirs. Okay, now having shared all those tips with you, I wanna get into some real case studies to manufacturers that I have worked with in the past and I've had a terrible experience with them. Um, so the first one was a manufacturer for um, creating custom packaging and printing stuff. And so they basically made, you know, cards, insert cards, they made tissue paper, they made um, bags, poly bags and things like that. And so the first problem with them was that um, after we had, you know, talked so much, you know, I never clarified with them, you know, ahead of time that I'm paying 30% deposit and 70% later, that's why it's one of my tips. But then they told me, oh, you know, you have to pay 70% deposit and 30% later. I was like, wait, whoa, 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 this never happens. You know, this is not standard practice. Who pays 70% ahead of time? Um, and so I told them, no, that's not going to happen. And so they were kind of arguing with me about that, saying, well, that's our new rule and that's how it is. And then I said, okay, I'll pay 50% ahead of time. I kind of negotiated with them and then we finally agreed to that. But that was the first kind of red flag for me. It was very strange, you know, why are you asking me this? Um, 
and it's something I should have asked them very early on in the communication. The next red flag was just that there was such unprofessional communication. I think that, you know, the thing is, when you're sourcing overseas and there is a language barrier, you cannot expect perfect English from someone whose native language is not English. That's unreasonable. But there are ways of communicating that's professional and that's not, especially, you know, people in Asia know that. They have very high standards of professionalism. Um, they've got great manners. And so when I noticed that this supplier was communicating with me very unprofessionally, I should have taken that as a red flag because um, it was just strange, you know, it was just weird, the communication, it was like they were talking to me like I was their friend and they could negotiate with me and they could convince me to do certain things and say, you know, it just wasn't right. Um, so, you know, trust your gut when it comes to that. I think oftentimes we just brush it off. We say, oh, it's just their style of communicating. But no, I think there are standards that it comes to when it comes to a business relationship and you guys should always keep that in mind. The next red flag was when they asked me to pay on PayPal instead of using trade assurance. So um, I had an order that was about $5,000 with them and they were saying like, they don't want to use trade assurance because it's going to cost them more money and they prefer me using PayPal, which is strange because usually the suppliers actually want you to use uh, wire transfers instead of PayPal because PayPal has higher fees. But for some reason they were avoiding the trade assurance and you know, for me, that was a little bit uncomfortable. I like using Alibaba Trade Assurance. I like, PayPal's fine, but uh, it's better for lower, you know, lower cost orders. You know, if things are under $1,000, under $2,000, but it's a $5,000 order, so I would have preferred to send a wire transfer. So they were kind of negotiating with me about that, which I felt a little bit uncomfortable about. The next issue we had is that um, when she printed the initial order, um, the quality, for example, I was getting these drawstring bags made, so these bags for, um, you know, putting my products inside, and they printed it, and the, the writing on the bags was starting to peel off, I could see that from the picture, and so she, she told me, you know, she, she was upfront about it, she said, yes, you know, there's a quality issue here, but she asked me to accept it, so she didn't want to fix the problem. Uh, she asked me to accept it the way it was and I said no, it has to be 100% perfect quality. If I'm purchasing something, I want good quality. I don't want my customers to receive something that's going to break down in a couple days. And so I ended up having to pay more for them to fix the quality, which was strange because I, I was saying, you know, why am I paying more for the exact same product? If you guys are having an issue on your end with your printing facility and something's wrong, you guys need to fix that. But I shouldn't have to be paying more for the same product I ordered in the first place. And then the final issue, which was the most annoying issue to me, was um, they printed tissue paper for me, like gift wrap paper that you would, you know, put in presents. And this tissue paper had specific, you know, I designed it with my own words. I had like inspiring words on it and I asked them to print it. And then they printed it, but they printed it wrong. They printed all of the units with my logo instead of using the actual text that I had given them, the design I had given them. And so they printed them all and then she told me about it and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry, we printed the wrong uh, design, um, please accept it anyways. And I said, no, this is not right. You know, if I'm giving you a design, this is what I want printed, this is the product I ordered, you need to redo it, you need to recreate it, um, and I'm not paying for that because it's a mistake on your part. But then uh, she started to basically make me feel bad and she's saying, please accept it because if you don't, then this person is gonna get fired, the one who printed it. And I can't share screenshots with you because she actually deleted the conversation on Skype. I was looking back on Skype and she deleted all the conversation she had. For weeks she was telling me, accept it, accept it, please, this person's gonna get fired. And here again, this is such an unprofessional way to communicate with someone that you're doing business with. And so at that point I was just so fed up. I had such a headache with this supplier and I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna pay extra for a new one. And so I learned my lesson at this point that this was not the right supplier for me. I'm finding someone else to create future orders with. Um, even though the supplier is cheaper, the supplier, you know, in the end, the products they printed were up to my standard, but all the hassle I went through and all the communication problems, it just wasn't worth it. Okay, so now we're gonna get into another supplier story. This supplier, you know, it wasn't a good experience at all for me, but a lot of it was my fault. So I think it's important for me to admit to that and to share with you what I did wrong. 
Okay, so with this supplier, I first established communication with them of August, uh, what was it, August 27th, 2017. And my products didn't get shipped until May 18th, 2018. It took them nine months to finish my order. So that is just not acceptable, that's not okay. Um, but it was on both of our parts, you know, partly because of them, partly because of me, partly because of difficulties at the bank, but that was just horrible. So this is a supplier that I used to create my Lux Curves underwear line. And so, you know, I got my samples initially, my customers were excited because I was posting photos on social media. And nine months later, I still don't have the product available for sale. And people are like, what is taking so long? and it's just a bad experience. So what were the warning signs with the supplier? Well, first of all, there were none. You know, the supplier was a supplier that had 10 years experience, a supplier that was gold, you know, had the gold badge, was an assessed supplier. The person, the initial contact with the supplier was very fast on, uh, uh, on Alibaba itself. They were very fast to communicate with me. So I really didn't see any issues with them. Um, it seemed pretty fine. It wasn't until later on that things got bad. Um, so there really weren't many warning signs for me and nothing I can really share with you to help you avoid this situation. So August 28th uh, on Alibaba, the supplier, the one I was communicating with, with, she asked me to convert, to move our conversation to Skype or WhatsApp. Now this is common. When you're talking to suppliers on Alibaba, eventually when they know they're gonna work with you, they're gonna want to communicate on Skype or WhatsApp because it is faster, you know? It's faster than going back and forth uh, via email. It's faster than Alibaba sometimes. Uh, and so it's good for you, but it's also can be, a, the reason they could be asking you to do this is because on Alibaba, they have a response rate. And in order for them to maintain their high response rate, they need to respond to you as soon as possible on Alibaba. But if they don't want to continue to respond to you as soon as possible, they might now ask to move the conversation off of Alibaba. So they might now converse with you on Skype where the response rate is not calculated. So then you might start to notice that it takes longer for them to respond to you. So the production time was quoted for one month. So that is, I think, in my opinion, it's okay. It's not ideal. I would say, you know, it depends on the nature of the product, but around you know, 20 days is, is a good amount of time, but one month was fine, so it's okay. So my mistake here was with the original sample with the supplier, I, instead of ordering a sample which they already had in stock, for example, if I'm sourcing underwear, this is what the case was, if I'm sourcing underwear, the supplier already has a similar style underwear, I could just request that sample to be sent to me because all I want to know at this point is I want to feel the quality of the product, I want to feel the materials, I want to see the color options, I want to see how they do with their stitching, like are they professional uh, with the seamstress? <laughs> I don't know the word for that. Um, and that was kind of the main goal with the sample. But instead what I did is I asked them for a custom sample. So a custom sample, they quoted me 20 days to make. So for me to wait 20 days just to receive the sample was too long. If I had just asked them for a basic sample, whatever they had in the warehouse, send it to me today, it could have been delivered to my house in four days with air shipping. So that was a mistake I made. Um, my initial sample should just be whatever they have just to see if they're good. And then if I find that the sample quality was good, then I can proceed with them with a second sample that is customized. When I received the sample, I noticed that the color of the band was not accurate. It's not what I wanted. And also the stitching was not well done. I didn't like the way they stitched it. It just looked unprofessional. And so I expressed those things to the supplier, but um, basically they didn't say that they could fix that. Um, so, you know, at that point, if that was a high of high value to me, and it really was, I should have maybe proceeded with another supplier who could have better quality stitching and the colors that I wanted. Okay, the reason it took so long was because after I received the samples, I told the supplier all the things I wanted them to change. I wanted them to make it bigger here. I wanted them to change the color of this and this and this and this. And then I expected the supplier to start working on that and produce another sample for me. And then 20, 30 days later, 
I'm messaging them, you know, constantly and they're saying, oh, I emailed you and you never responded. And it was just like this lack of communication on both parts and ended up wasting 30 days of time. They never even started with all the edits that I had given them. So we lost 30 days right there. And then we had issues with the bank. So I sent them my deposit, they never received it. It took like three months for them to receive it. There were some issues with the wire transfer. Um, so that just took a really long time. And now I'm trying to communicate with the supplier, you know, placing another order, which I don't actually intend to do with them, but I just wanted to see if they would actually respond to me. And it's been over a month and they haven't responded. So if I'm in the situation now where I need to place a second order with the supplier, I'm out of luck. I'm going to have to find someone really quick to replenish my inventory because the supplier is no longer responsive. So that's just kind of like not great uh, and it's mistakes on both parties, but you live and you learn. So that's the story. Um, so I think it's just like really being aware of things, really be conscious of your communication, of what's going on, um, and definitely listen to your gut. So hopefully these tips help you when you're picking your supplier. If they did, please thumbs up this video and share it with someone who could benefit from this. And I will see you guys in the next LuxBiz video. Bye.